Hey folks, so this week's review key was helpfully heaved my way by the Indie Gaming Collective, providing me the opportunity to cover Studio Thunder Horse's action-packed platformer, Flynn, Son of Crimson. Which means it's time to do a deep dive to see whether it left me flushed with excitement, or if I would have preferred this son remained wayward. I'm your host Arlian, let's find out together. Flynn follows the story of, well, Flynn a resident of the Isle of Rosantica. It's a scenic corner of the world, though there's been a fair share of problems of late, such as the fact that an ancient evil known as the Scourge has been cropping back up, or the fact that when you went to walk your rad dog, not only were you bullied by a mysterious girl, she also left your good boy on death's door. Thankfully, as the descendant of Rosantica's local heroes, you're more than equipped to make the trek needed to find the ancient items needed to revive your dog. Oh, and to tackle the whole vile malignance encroaching on the island. Anyway, summary aside, I actually had a fair bit of fun with Flynn's story. Primarily, it's told through NPC dialogue and pleasantly paced. You never really feel the game is cramming an excess of exposition down your throat. I mean, okay, there is a late game puzzle that also doubles as a dense story blurb to help pave the way for the finale, but that's like an exception, and frankly, in the face of the generally Swiss storytelling, I really didn't mind it. That said, there's a whole lot more to Flynn than its story beats. Though, to be fair, the game does start out deceptively simple control-wise. We're talking a dodge with a short cooldown, and a very basic set of attacks you can whip out in order to pummel enemies. And given you build up a stagger bar on most foes, it's a legitimate tactic. That said, as you progress forward, you begin to unlock a few extra elements, such as a basic ranged attack, limited charge heals, and even a potent super mode that enables you to churn out rapid-fire AoE attacks for a set duration until it burns itself out. All of these help provide some degree of nuance to your kit, especially as the stages begin to showcase more interesting enemies to engage with and environmental hazards. But well, it really isn't until you reach the second area that you get a real feel for how Flynn played. See, once you encounter a certain NPC, you gain the ability to use red gems you've solely been accruing in order to purchase new abilities from the skill tree. While there's a few that represent a boost of damage or, or crit, a large number instead expand upon your offensive options. We're talking about lengthier combos, launcher options, and even aerial combos and finishers. It's at about this juncture that you move away from the basic hack and slash skill set only to find yourself more than capable of pulling off some stylish combos as you progress forward. Especially when you begin to unlock the other weapons, between the balanced sword, the chonky axe, and some aerially focused claws, you've got a decent arsenal to play with, made all the better by the fact that while I had my preferences, I didn't really feel that one wound up overshadowing the others. They all had situational uses that made them feel invaluable. Plus, I could freely swap between them, which made for some fun fight potential, and that's not the only dynamic element in your repertoire either. Pretty early on, you begin to gain upgrades to your range attack, allowing you to charge and elementally imbue it. And since you can do it during a combo, you can wind up with some devastatingly fun options. And sure, you do need to spend red gems to refine your skills, but honestly, progression feels affordable, even with a death penalty of 8% of your current red gems. I mean, it does help that any weapon-related upgrades unlock for all weapons you own, that said, I think another facet is how generous the game is. See, beyond the gems you get from scattered deposits, combat, and even just clearing stages, you also have another major resource in the form of hidden collectibles scattered throughout the majority of levels. Provided you bring them to an NPC, they're worth 1k a pop. What's more, you can choose to hold onto them until you're ready to buy a skill, so you're not at any risk of losing resources. Not that you're that at risk. Like, I played on hard and generally found my experience to feel pretty fair, with most of my deaths being localized to a few experiences near the tail end of the game. And even then, I didn't really feel like I'd put myself at much of a disadvantage financially. Now, this is before the most recent patch, where hard mode was apparently made more challenging, but even still, the game felt fair. Like, yes, there's definitely some tricky stages in the game, especially as you venture forth and find yourself facing obstacles like an angry dragon incessantly charging you, acid rain, or the time-honored tradition of a windy ice level. That said, I think the crux of these moments where I broke even likely involved the bonus battle stages, which, um, yeah, if you're not feeling all that challenged by the main game or the many different flavors of environmental hazards provided by its regions, there's some hidden locked doors and keys to find. Bring the two together and you'll earn your way to a pretty tough challenge area that will see you battle a number of waves for a prize. 
And these aren't short waves either. Like, as you progress forward, there is an oppressive number of enemies to exterminate, chosen from the worst each area has to offer in squads meant to mess you up. So, yeah, some of the later ones come to my profit margin a bit, enough so that I just beat up some bosses for some comparatively easy money instead. Though, the bosses are also just a lot of fun to fight. While there's only a handful, they're distinct encounters with their own nuances and challenges, which can't be readily cheesed, no air juggling your woes away. Instead, you'll actually need to learn their patterns in order to maximize your murderification. The, uh, the caster boss can kindly run itself face first into a string of fireballs and then a train, that friggin' stubborn tryhard. Not that you're strictly limited to combat for your capitalist needs. Instead, if you've been more keen on combing areas, you do have ample alternatives that open up along with the expansion of your arsenal and skills. Frankly, found it rewarding to dive back into earlier areas in order to eke out secrets I missed, especially given the game's kind enough to let you know what items are squirreled away and if there's multiple exits in its stages. That said, while I generally found the game's puzzle-solving exploration to be a blast, I do feel the need to make a small note here. Me and the wall jump did not jive at the time of recording. Like, I get that I wasn't supposed to hold the direction during it, but there were times when I was trying to initiate one mid-air for evasive reasons where this was less than intuitive. Now, this has been also patched in the recent thing, so you'll have to let me know in the comments how the wall jump feels now. But yeah, with that said, it's about time to dive into aesthetics, and honestly, I really enjoy the visual detail that was put into Flynn. Like, this game looks stellar, whether it's the sheer detail put into the character models, the lightning, or even the weight of animations during a combo, it's just delightfully fluid and fun to witness, and in a mechanical sense, I find the game made good use of both environmental and enemy animations to help clue players in to incoming hazards, which made me a happy camper. Though, not as happy as the soundtrack made me. There's something really fun about the music in Flynn. From stage to stage, there's a good array of tunes to listen and vibe to. So yeah, that brings us to the end, and if you couldn't tell, I've had a lot of fun with Flynn. Sure, it took a little while for the combat to get really juicy, but once it did, I felt intensely rewarded for tinkering about. What's more, even when the combat wasn't the main focus, the platforming exploration were solid throughout. I had a lot of fun adapting to the various environmental hazards I came face to face with, and heck, even when the game had me go through remixed versions of earlier stages I cleared, the experience was still distinct enough that I found it to be a short but sweet diversion. And also, it's pretty fun to ride around with a dog whenever you get the chance, but yeah, what I'm trying to say is, Flynn is a thoroughly fun romp, and I'd strongly recommend it, enough to call it a solid hit. And while I know some folks may be hesitant because of losing muns when dying, there's three difficulties and even an accessible option to avoid damage if you just want to explore the world and see the story. Oh, and if you historically fight with game inputs, Flynn's compatible with keyboard and controller and is fully mappable, including your mouse, which is what I wound up doing because, yeah, my controller's still broken. Anywho, thanks for tuning in. If you agree, disagree, or just have something to say to me, feel free to comment. If you really do agree with what I have to say or just find it interesting, I'd also appreciate if you give it a share. And if you enjoy my efforts to create new indie reviews, interviews, and gaming content, hit the subscribe button and the bell so you know when there's a new release. For the Discord savvy folks, click the video description to find a link to my community, the Crit Hit Cauldron. Lastly, if you want to see me get dunked on in indie games, check out my Twitch at twitch.tv slash Arlian for all my live fuck-ups. That said, I'll catch you on the next episode of Crit Hit. Take care till then, folks.